thank you for joining us for as part of Product Mastery Series. We've got an awesome product leader joining us today, Manik Gupta, the former Chief Product Officer at Uber. And the AMA today will be focused on innovation at scale. So Manik, I would love to know about your journey. You've got an illustrious career. I would love to know about what you've done so far. Yeah, so Mo, thank you so much for, for inviting me to this. And hi, everyone. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy uh, during these interesting times. Um, so my journey, um, I've done a, quite a few things over the years. Uh, I've been in the tech industry for over 20 years at this point. And uh, you know, in a brief, uh, brief outline, I've been an entrepreneur. Uh, the first thing I did out of college uh, when I graduated was to found my own e-commerce company. Uh, I was a VP of engineering. I was a founder. I built the whole site. This was the height of the dot-com days. So had a successful exit, uh, ran the company for about four years, um, and then you know spent about another few years at Hewlett Packard, uh, again, during the heydays of Hewlett Packard, if you will, where they were trying to compete with Dell and uh, go direct. And I was brought in to help them um, you know, figure out their e-commerce strategy. Uh, spent a majority of my career at Google, Subsequently, um, I was there for almost eight years on the Google Maps team, and uh, where I was responsible for really building the maps everywhere. And uh, uh, you know, during my time, um, as Android became popular, as the iPhone became popular, Google Maps went from uh, you know a very a few hundred thousand, a few million user product to almost a billion users. And it was just interesting for me to see that entire journey of uh, how uh, how many users uh, started using it everywhere. Um, and then uh, the last four years, I was at Uber, um, where for you know I did a couple of different jobs within Uber, and for a couple of years, uh, I was uh, the chief product officer, first on an interim basis, and then on a permanent basis, uh, leading the company to the IPO. Um, and the last um, six months since I left Uber, I've just been taking a break, spending time with family, but also been very focused on uh, as an angel investor, as an advisor. And uh, you know, we also started a, a COVID nineteen focused uh, nonprofit, which I would love to tell you folks about as well if you have time. And uh, I'm really excited that we have built a set of solutions that we believe can really help uh, uh, you know keep people safe. So that's been my journey. More more you know, tech person, product person uh, have had the opportunity and the privilege and the good luck, if you will, to be part of many world transformation companies. And I'm happy to share my experiences along the way. We are really excited to dig in, Monik. Thanks for sharing your background. So there's a lot of product managers um, here. And, and one of the questions that we thought about was, you've had the opportunity to hire and develop a lot of PMs. What have you seen that sets apart the strongest PMs from the rest? Yeah, you know, uh, the PM function itself has evolved quite a bit over the years. Um, uh, the you know, if I were to really condense it down to what I have seen, and if I look at the people who I've seen succeed very, very well in companies, uh, both small and large, um, I would kind of boil it down to three things. The first is um, a genuinely high energy and curiosity about everything, right? Uh, these are people, I mean, you know, when you meet these people, right? These people are like generally curious about things. They really love to understand how things work. Uh, how you know how people work with each other, whether they're team members, uh, what are some of the customer problems, what are the new approaches that can be taken, what's the competition doing. So that genuine curiosity and that high energy really sets people apart as strong PMs because a large part of the job, in my opinion, is really about exciting people and getting them motivated to go after a big problem. The second one is exemplary communication skills. Uh, I can't endorse that enough, uh, underscore that enough. Uh, especially given what we are doing right now in the world today where everything is remote and uh, it's probably going to stay that way for, for a while more. And having the ability both written and spoken communication, I know this is something which everybody talks about, but for PMs, I feel this is even more important because you have to, um, you have to like synthesize information uh, and expand on the information in, on a very frequent basis. Um, so that's the, that's the second thing I'd say. The third one is, low ego and collaboration. And uh, this is all about people's intention of bringing out the best in others and, and amplifying the best ideas, amplifying the best voices, uh, or amplifying everyone's voices, rather, in, in the room, as opposed to just uh, you know sitting on your soapbox and trying to sort of be in charge of everything. 
I think low ego PMs are, are the ones who ultimately, in my mind, succeed because um, they, they, they come across as people who genuinely have the interests of the customer and the team at heart, and uh, they end up building much more successful products. Awesome. Yeah, I like that low ego one resonates with something that I heard from Jeff Bezos that you should have strong opinions, but weakly yeah. help. If you, if you hear something better, be able to drop your opinion. Now, um, aside from solving immediate customer needs, product managers are also innovating on where their product should head in the future. Knowing that, how do product managers develop their long-term th thinking skill set? How do PMs pick up on key trends? Yeah, the, you know, this is this is a really important question because to me, um, you know, when you're building a product, you're not building a product in isolation, right? You're building a product to solve a customer pain point, but at the same time, given the pace of change in our industry and in general, um, the customer needs and customer behaviors also change. And you're also not building your product in isolation where your competitor is not doing anything. You, know, you have a lot of competitors who are also pulling and pushing in different directions. Um, so to me, I think there are two things I would say. One is really adopt a, a platform thinking mindset. Um, you know, there are at this stage in the technology industry, at least, there are lots of, uh, there are very few platforms and ecosystems. So you have the Apple, Google, Facebooks of the world, and all these are big companies. They're multi-trillion dollar companies at this point, which is just incredible to see as a technology industry. And it's very important for a PM, regardless of what product you're working on, to keep a very close eye on what these companies are doing. Now, sometimes, you know, these companies are so big that you can't like, keep an eye just on the company and, and, you know, there's just so much going on. But of course, there are certain facets of these companies which are important, especially the platform ones. Like, for instance, where is Android going? Where is iOS going? Uh, what is Facebook doing with its social graph and so on? Because that will have very interesting impacts in terms of your long range thinking. So that's one aspect that I frequently think about. Um, the second is technology also, my observation is technology also moves in waves. So you have these tech waves that come in. So so when, you, you know, I don't know how many people remember when the, when the first browser came out, right? Um, you know, when Netscape came out and Mozilla came out and, you know, all, all, all that, um, all the good stuff, uh, there was this big sort of explosion of people uh, building websites, right? Because now there was a way to get to them. So the first wave was about really the websites. Then when mobile came out, it all became about apps and app stores. And then social came out and it was all about the like button everywhere and the friends graph. You know, the like button is, is, is not, a, it's not been around for that many years, right? Uh, so, but, but it's kind of prevalent everywhere now, right? So that, or that, that consumer behavior is prevalent everywhere. Uh, then you have this phase where you have a lot of on-demand companies like the Ubers of the world. And that, it, you know, over there it was about you just push a button and you get something. Something physically happens in the real world when you push a button and it comes to you, right? Um, and there's a lot of talk these days about machine learning and AI with uh, computer vision, self-driving. Just yesterday I saw that Google announced that every Android phone can now detect earthquakes, right? So, so they have now built the biggest network of earthquake detecting uh, devices in the world, and they're putting that into the earthquake system, right? So, so there's a lot of these interesting trends that are happening. As a PM, you have to really keep a track on all the evolution there and then contextualize that to your product. And it's, it's an always evolving thing. Got it. So basically, watch the big players, understand the trends, because you, the, you know the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and you know these big players are are, are obviously. I mean, they're so big. Um, they're doing a bunch of stuff. But then there are tons of open spaces. You know, there are all these edges that, because of organizational reasons or other reasons, that these companies are prioritized. And as an entrepreneur, as a product person, that's actually a perfect niche to play in and kind of build out your product and then just grow from there. And most good companies actually come out that way. Got it. Yeah, um, no, that's that's great. Um, so the other, the next set of questions are really digging into innovation. So when you think about, I've worked for large companies, you know, large traditional enterprises, they know the importance of innovation. They understand it, but they often fail at it. You know, Uber has successfully been able to launch multiple category defining businesses, and it's almost like innovation is a process. You look at Uber Freight, Uber Money, Uber Aviation, you just go on and on. Seems like Uber is just innovating as a process. You know, what can traditional companies learn from Uber? Yeah, uh, I was very fortunate to be, be a part of Uber over the four years because we had so many new bets that we went after. 
Um, I think a few observations I would share, and I'm not saying that these are observations that can just be replicated because every company has its different culture, different constraints, and so on. Um, I think a few things that stood out to me. One was by design, Uber really set up cross-functional teams and gave them a lot of autonomy. So whenever there was a new bet that was being farmed, it was farmed pretty much with like all the functions, uh, you know, uh, end to end. And you give them a lot of autonomy, typically with one or two leaders, and, and ask them to just go run hard at that problem. Give them resources, give them funding, give them air cover to just go for it. The second one was, as, as a corollary to that, there was a lot of debate within Uber around, why are we duplicating things, right? Because imagine if you're an engineer and you're working on that team, you're probably writing code you know, to build your own platform versus taking dependency on a platform that already exists, right? And uh, one good thing that Uber did was that um, they made it possible for people to just do that, right? You had permission to just duplicate stuff and not worry too much about efficiencies initially. Of course, when you scaled up, then you have to bring in the efficiencies because, you know, it becomes too complicated. Uh, the architecture becomes too complicated. But uh, there was a lot of uh, latitude for, company, for, for teams to build their own product, build their own stack, build their own processes and not worry too much about duplication and just run hard at the problem. Because, you know, when you're in that phase, you're trying out a bunch of different things and you don't really know what's going to stick. Uh, and by the way, that to me, honestly, is a very hard thing for most large enterprises to stomach. Because most large companies would be, well, you know, you need to talk to some VP of software somewhere or some other division person or whatever, and then talk to them and get on their roadmap. They'll talk to you. You're so small that they'll talk to you in six months. And by that time, it's like game over, right? So I think Uber did a really good job of not falling into that trap. Um, there were a lot of other issues with it, but I can we can talk about that too. And then the other thing was uh, the culture. Like you put people in charge who are who have de demonstrated that they have the ability and the natural inclination to be these builders and the zero to one people. You know, there are people who just love attacking a problem from scratch and then building the first set of products. They may not be the same set of people who actually scale it later on because that requires a different skill set. Of course, a lot of times they are the same people, they, but they don't, don't necessarily have to be. But I, I, I would argue that finding the right sort of people initially to kind of have the kernel of your team, which is going after the problem, is a really important one. So I think Uber kind of checked on all those three dimensions. Uh, and I feel that's the reason why they can continue to build stuff at pretty rapid pace. Yeah, as you were talking about that, you know, really giving true autonomy and um, it brought back memories of my experience of not having that at a large enterprise, you know, so to, 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 to recap, like true cross-functional teams and perfection is the enemy of progress. So let teams be inefficient in the beginning, but, but that, that's really how you innovate. So, so thanks for that. So um, the next question around innovation is when you think about launching a new business that is at Uber scale or even Google, right? Like, you don't they don't launch businesses for a thousand or a million users, it's gotta be a 10 million business, a hundred million, a billion users. That takes a really long time. How do you keep your teams motivated when they're just at the beginning of that experience? How do you keep them motivated to, to, to capture that product vision? Um, I'll give you an example from Google. Uh, maybe Google Maps would be a useful one to talk about here. So I, I almost think that if you are going to go after a big market and you want to become a big product in terms of number of users and the impact that you create, you have to have a very ambitious mission. Uh, and I'll get to the vision in a second. Um, so for, for the longest time, um, and I, I would imagine it's still the case right now, the, the mission for Google Maps was to map the real world as it changes, right? And just think about that for a second, right? You want to map the whole world, right? Provide that on a digital platform. And you want to also keep up with the world as it changes, right? And um, this also means because the world keeps changing, you are never done, right? So we used to joke about this all the time at Google Maps. It's like we are working on a problem which will, where if, if we get to 90%, 95% ish of, uh, of reality, we would be like massively successful because the remaining 5%, by the time we understand what has changed in the world, our map is always going to be outdated. So there is no perfect map of the world ever because the world keeps changing, right? The traffic keeps changing, the roads keep getting built, so on and so forth. So if you have such a such an ambitious mission, you know you automatically have team members who understand that uh, whatever work they are doing, it's it's in service of that mission, and that mission is almost like a timeless mission. So it gives you very long range thinking by by default. 
The challenge comes when you when you take that mission and you create a product vision out of it or a company vision out of it, which has to be more concrete, right? It has to be something that people can relate to. Otherwise, they'll be like, how do I relate my work to this ambiguous, timeless mission? So again, at Google Maps, I think we did a really good thing where we had we evolved the vision, the product vision over time. And um, basically, um, you know, it, at every milestone, you know, when we went from desktop to mobile, right? There was a big, big change in terms of vision. Where the vision was about on desktop, it was about giving you all the information in a in a in a very sort of a rich format, right? You can have the satellite imagery, you can have the street view imagery, and so on. But when you went to mobile, it was all about condensing it and getting you to getting get, giving you a turn by turn navigation uh, in your cell phone, which was a pretty crazy idea at that time. That you can just get in your car put in the destination and it will start navigating you and it will give you GPS directions where you don't need to buy a GPS unit, right? And this, by the way, is going to be better, right? It's going to be more real time and so on. So I think your product vision has to be something that you recalibrate every few quarters, years to make sure that the team is headed in the right direction. But you can always point your vision to the mission. And as long as you have a long range mission, I think you will always do the right thing and you'll inspire people to stick it through. And then, of course, you'll have all the kind of feedback loops coming in that you're doing the right thing. So that's that's how at least I've thought about it over the years. Awesome. That's great. Um, so there's uh, going over to one of the questions. There's a great question in the same theme. And it's actually I was having a, a, a conversation with the senior PM uh, yesterday about this as well. But there's a question from Nick Gray, who is a product leader drop. And he asked, how do you determine the right big bets for your organization while maintaining alignment? Yeah, no. So, so this this gets harder as you become bigger. I mean, there is no there is no perfect answer to this because every organization is different. Every team has a different perspective. I can give you a little bit context on what I did at at, at Uber because you know it was almost a more than an eleven hundred person product organization, about four thousand engineers. Um, so, first and foremost, when you get to that kind of size, is really or or even if you don't get to that size, to to answer the question more directly. You always, have, I'm a big believer in planning. Now, planning is in many cases a four letter word, right? Like it's, you know, people hate it, right? No, they, you, you can pull almost anybody and you can ask them, like, do you like planning? People are like, are you kidding me? Like, no, like nobody likes planning, right? Nobody likes roadmaps, nobody likes OKR planning, you know, none of those activities, right? But I think there are, you know, at a certain level done by those are really important because to me, planning is a way to express the priorities for the organization. If you don't do planning, which is a combination of top down goal setting and bottoms up innovation, you will never have the ability to identify those big bets that Nick is asking about those four to five, maybe three to five, depending on you know, the size of the organization, those, those three to five big bets that you want to go after. So to me, Planning is really important, and out of planning comes the, the top level priorities, right? Which are the top three to five projects or big bets that you want to go after. And for me, it's always been about making sure that we staff those projects first and we deploy all our resources to those projects first before we do some of the other stuff. Because if we don't do that, then what will happen is everyone will want to do their own project and nobody will want to really contribute towards these three to five priorities. So, so, so you have to be kind of top down in that sense to make sure you identify those priorities and then, and then communicate to the org. And then you have to have a system in place which has metrics and dashboards and so on where people can track progress. Because there's no point that you set the priorities for the org, you tell everybody we have made trade-offs, and then people can't even track progress. They'll just stop believing you, right? They will say, you know, this is all you know, this is all not correct, right? Because why is my project not being high prioritized? Because I can show progress on my project, but none of the other projects are making any progress. So you have to get into that cadence of metrics and dashboard and reporting and so on. And the final point I'd make is uh, on this um, topic is, it's really about, for, around alignment is, it's about communication and goes back to, you know, what successful PMs do really well. Uh, it's about communication and repetition. You have to keep repeating every week, every opportunity you get. Here are the top three priorities. Here's why we are working on them. And if anybody has any question, listen to the question, answer the question, but reiterate, right? Because the bigger the org is, you'll be surprised how many people are, new people joining, people are leaving, people forget, people have so many other options, so many priorities. So you just have to do a job, whether you're a product leader at a senior level, at a junior level, anybody for that matter, 
You just have to keep repeating the priorities because repetition becomes the way things get done. So, so in, in short, it's hard, uh, but I think it can be done uh, and it's messy, but you know, there are ways in which you can just do the right planning, uh, get the top priorities and just repeat them and make sure people are able to track progress against it and you'll make progress. Awesome. So be, be a broken record on your communication. Absolutely. Repeat, repeat many times. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. So guys, great questions. Keep on asking your questions and upvoting them and we'll address them as we're going through this. Um, so the next uh, question, and I think you've answered part of it, but the, the other part that I often get asked is around um, struggling with alignment, right? So, you know, different teams, when you think about OKRs, there, there's the, here's your OKRs. How do you make sure everyone's working and moving in the same direction? You had a team of over a thousand employees, uh, not just product, but data science and a whole other functions. How do you keep the over 1,000 employees, all the vectors moving in the same direction? What are some tips and tricks there? Yeah, I, I think I covered some of them. Um, you know, what I would say is is it sort of goes back again to um, how. So, so just to give you a concrete example, right? So um, at, at Uber, we, um, when, when I was a CPO, what we used to do was to start, we, we used to do planning annually. So as part of our annual planning, we will come up with uh, the company level goals, which will be decided at an executive level. And then you take those goals and then you kind of cascade that to what the product team can do together with the engineering, right? Because that's, that's really where a lot of the work happens. So you, you basically do a lot of uh, activity around getting the best ideas out there from, from people, but at the same time being very clear that these are the top goals that we want to hit as a company. Uh, and once you have set those, then the question is, what are the projects that are going to be the ones that, that we want to align on? And you spend some time aligning on those projects, making sure that the right people are staffed on it. You know, it's one thing to say, yeah, we want to do this. And you will be amazed how many times people want to do things, but they don't put anybody on it. Right. So then, then how is that going to happen? Like, you know, when you look at a resource map for many companies, re resource maps actually tell you the true priorities. You know, you, you could be thinking as a product leader that here are my three priorities. And yeah, everybody's working on them. But when you actually examine and look at where people are spending their time, they might be completely different. So you have to have the right sort of framework to make sure that you have the not only the projects defined, but then you have the, uh, the people resources uh, allocated to it. And then you just track it. And then it kind of goes back to the point I was making earlier, which is about repeating it, making sure people are on the same page. Whenever there are conflicts, you make decisions fast. Uh, a lot of those things just get into, into aligning the team and keeping them all, all in the same direction. Awesome. And yeah, that's you got to do the work up front to make sure everyone's aligned so that it's more successful later on. That's awesome. Now moving to uh, our third set of questions, which are just miscellaneous and a and around product skill set and, and a few other things. So the first question here is around product growth. So um, what is your opinion on product managers understanding the importance of product growth? When you think about there are so many things competing for our attention right now, right? If you're not on the first page, you're ignored. So sure, if you are Uber and, and Google, you may not have that problem of, of thinking about growth because you can you can borrow users from your platform, but but if you're not in that situation, if you're not on the first page, do you? What's your thoughts on product growth as a core skill set that product managers should understand? Yeah, no, I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I think it's really important that PMs early on understand how to bring customers to their product. Right? Um, you can be building a consumer product. You could be building an enterprise product doesn't really matter, right? You, you Getting the first set of customers using your product and then making it viral, if it's a consumer product or even for an enterprise product, getting the adoption within, within, an, uh, within a company are really important skills. And the good news is that there are lots of good playbooks out there now where people have tried this in multiple different companies. Um, I think we're almost seeing, especially maybe because things are remote right now, you're seeing an and an explosion of very good insights. People who are coming out and giving tons of insights and frameworks and newsletters and 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 playbooks, if you will, which I would encourage people to sort of you know go go follow because uh, it, the best way to learn is learn from people who have already done it and then see what are the mistakes they made so you don't make those mistakes. Um, I I also think that there are certain inflection points that typically happen when you are building product uh, when it comes to growth. So oftentimes people will say. Well, I already have a product that, let's say, has a million users, right? 
Um, I don't need to worry about growth. I think that's actually very, that's, that's not the best way to think about things because there are all these inflection points. One inflection point that I've seen that happens is when you go from uh, one geography to multiple geographies, right? So now your product is no longer in the US, for instance, and now it has to be inter internationalized. That's like a big growth vector, right? And how do you manage that? Because now you're competing on somebody else's turf, you need to localize, you need to do a lot of that stuff. So you need to sort of understand how to manage that part of growth. The second growth lever that I've seen or the vector I've seen is when you go from a one product to a multi-product company, right? So you had one product and you were selling it uh, or, or you know, consumers were using it and now you have another product that you're building. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about Uber and Uber Eats in, in that context. Do you share the same customers? Do you have a different customer base? How does that really work? How does a you know customer journey between these products work? So that's another part of the growth, right? The third is you could be just coming up with a brand new feature set, right? And that feature set itself, you have to think about it as if it was a mini product in itself. And how are you going to grow it? So, so long and short of it, I feel that the ability to understand what the growth levers are, where are the values, how do you test things, how do you experiment, how are you able to you know, really leverage Google and Facebook, which are kind of the gatekeepers to a large extent today from a customer acquisition standpoint. Um, how do you sort of monetize that appropriately? I think a lot of those skill sets, uh, the good news is that there are lots of data available out there and best practices, but, but traditionally PMs tend to ignore this. And I think that's a miss. So, you know, your question is very timely. I would really, really give a big call, big call to action for people to sort of learn those skill sets because they're going to become more and more important. Got it. Awesome. That's great. Now let's switch over to some of the questions that we have in the audience. Um, so Uber, uh, sorry, not Uber, uh, Umar Farooq, um, who is a senior PM at Ada, asked the question, um, how do you measure the performance of a product manager? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, um, different companies do it differently. Um, what, what I've had the opportunity to see is, um, we came up with a set of competencies for evaluating product managers. And these competencies were around certain dimensions like um, strategy, execution, uh, organizational uh, management skills, depending if they're a little bit more senior, um, innovative, innovation, um, and, and you know, a bunch of other sort of parameters. So, so you have these competencies, you can then construct a, a, a kind of a matrix, if you will, of these competencies and levels in the organization. So if, you're, if it's a junior PM or a mid-level PM or a senior PM, how would you rate them? Typically, you know, as you go more senior, you know, your complexity and scope and innovation requirements, all that, that increases. So, so I think that's typically how, that's a more formulaic way to do it. Um, but I kind of go back to the first question that Moed asked me, which is how do I look at good PMs? And it's really those three things, right? Like if I see somebody who is, it was very generally curious, is moving fast, doing good things. It has low ego, right? And, and is really able to, um, able to kind of communicate effectively. I think to me, of course, the output has to be there. The, the, the tangible output of all their projects has to be there. But those are the ones that I feel, um, in my experience at least, go on to do very, very good things. Awesome. That's great. So there's two questions that are combined. So I'm going to actually combine them together. Um, the first one is from uh, Scott Affleck, who is a VP of product at RateHub. And this ties into Brian Yee's question, who is the director of innovation at um, Ravel by Cadillac Fairview. And both their questions are in the theme of managing innovation. So um, they ask, you know, you mentioned the importance of planning. No one likes to plan, but it's super important. Uh, you know, planning is important for growth, but you need to leave space for innovation in teams. So how do you go about managing that process of planning uh, and balancing experimentation and long-term projects for proven success? And Brian's question added to that is around metrics. What are some measures of success for innovation? Yeah, so, so um, at Google, we used to follow a very interesting framework, which I have personally followed, or at least tried to follow for many years at this point. Um, we used to have this 70-20-10 framework. So a lot of people also talk about this in terms of horizons. Uh, I've heard that term used uh, quite a few times at this point. So 70-20-10 framework is 70%, and, and again, this is sort of roughly speaking, 70% of your resources should be focused on core, meaning you know, things that we need to ship, uh, what's important to the company in the next, let's say in the next three to six months, right? 20% are 
uh, are probably more than six months to uh, 18 months, right? And 10% are these wild bets that you can take, which can, uh, which are very, very early, even if they completely don't go anywhere, totally fine. You only put 10% of your resourcing on it, but they will likely have uh, the, out if they're successful, you'll have a, have a likely outcome, a positive outcome in the next 24 months, right? Uh, and don't hold me to the 6, 18, 24. It doesn't really matter. It's basically just a way of thinking about it because then you can have the right answer for your organization. And the reason why that's important is uh, it allows people and your from a portfolio allocation standpoint, especially, see, planning is about portfolio allocation, right? You have a set of projects, you have a set of resources, you have a set of priorities, right? How are you going to kind of mesh all of that together to make sure that the right people are working on the right priorities and the right projects, right? So, so in that case, you can kind of divide it up in this manner. And typically, if you start that way, you will always leave some room for innovation because, you know, and one of the, one of the challenges that people have is everyone finds that 10% the sexy 10%. Everybody, I mean, if you ask anybody, hey, would you want to work on execution or innovation? What do you think people are going to say? Of course, I want to be innovative. So, yeah. so you, you have to really think through this because the 70%, which is the core, without that, by the way, the bills don't get paid in the company. There's a lot of innovation happening there. So, so innovation has to be kind of thought through from like giving some room across the board. But then there are there this allocation allows you to at least make sure that the priorities of the company are aligned and, and you can you can do the right things. So that's that's the the framework um, that I think about. And the second question was around uh, metrics, right? So yeah, measuring innovation. How, so yeah. measuring innovation. I mean, you know, it, it, it really is. It, it kind of goes back to how you think about um, connecting the output of the product to the business. And that's actually another big thing that I would request that people start thinking more about. The role of product management is changing. Uh, it's not just about customer satisfaction. It's just not just about building it for the customer. You have to connect that to business outcomes more and more. And uh, to me, the success criteria for innovation is, well, you know, we came up with a new idea. How do we test it? What were some of the criteria? What was our insight going into coming up with that idea? Did we expect to win more market share? Did we uh, expect to win more customers? Did we want to improve our NPS with these customers? Whatever what were the metrics up front, you then measure against that. I don't think it's, there's no one metric to rule it all. You just have to kind of look at it on a project or priority basis and say, these are the metrics and make sure you do a diligent job of coming up with those metrics so that you can track them and then you can hit them so that you can see whether you were successful or not. Got it. So it's kind of you have to start to link back to business outcomes, which is which is a great reminder for for all of us. Um, the next question I want to dig into a bit of, of your experience. Um, you know, if you were to go back and um, look back at things, and you were if you were to prioritize things differently as a product leader, knowing what you know now, what would those things be? Um. So I think at Google, I kind of got spoiled uh, as a PM because my product was free, right? It was distributed by default on every Android phone or, you know, so I didn't have to worry about distribution, right? Uh, I'm talking about Google Maps, obviously. Um, and I didn't have to really connect that much to business outcomes, right? So so when I, when I came to Uber, it was, it was, it took me some time to kind of learn learn those aspects, right? Because Uber is not a free product, it's a paid product. Uh, you know, distribution matters. You have to figure out how to get the app in front of more and more people and it's expensive. Um, and then of course you have to connect to business outcomes. So I would say that, uh, echoing what I was saying a little bit earlier, that learning how to connect your work to business outcomes is something I would have prioritized earlier because I, I would have just become better at it, right? I kind of had a very fast course, uh, um, you know, I had to learn that pretty fast at Uber. But at Google, you know, and, and even earlier in my career, if I had learned that, I would have been a better PM. Um, and the second is also, uh, if I if I look at where, if you look at the product job today, a lot of lot of collaboration and a lot of interdependency uh, exists between product managers and data scientists because experimentation and data driven experimentation is becoming a very, I mean, it's always been important, but it's becoming even more important because the uh, experimentation is getting democratized, so everyone can do it. And you have all these tools and frameworks and analysis that can happen. So I would have prioritized, uh, you know, some of the data science techniques as a PM. I would have prioritized learning that earlier. So those are the two two areas that I would have focused a little bit more on um, because that would, you know, that would make me even more much more effective as a PM. That's awesome. Yeah, great advice for us uh, for everyone here. 
Uh, now, uh, Karen has a question around, um, Karen Fu is a product design lead at Drop, and she's asked a question around, um, in the situation where you need to pivot your product, what are some key questions you can ask uh, to help to de-risk? Or when, I think the interpretation would be, how do you know when to pivot your product? Because oftentimes, you have the tendency of falling in love with your, your with your solution, and you can, you know, you often de-risk too. You often pivot too late. But how do you know when you should pivot? Uh, that's a great question. I would say that there are two two um, buckets of signs, if you will, that I would say. The first bucket is your metrics. Okay, um, if your metrics are not going up and to the right, right, like where where you know you you thought you'll get some user traction, you thought your NPS is going to be high, you thought um your uh, your retention is going to be high right your, your engagement is going to be high if none of those things are happening and the data is telling you something then that's that's one area the second is which people don't fully do i mean i'm, I'm amazed how much how, how little people do this just ask your team they'll tell you it's not working they'll, they'll be i mean if you if you are a pm who has a low ego kind of uh, outlook just go and ask your engineers like are you having fun doing this is this even working like, do you wake up in the morning and you come to work and like, oh my God, I'm just going to work on this product and make it work? They'll, you'll have all the signs in the team because somebody out there has come to this conclusion that, man, this is not working, right? We got to do something different here. But they are not, they're reluctant to kind of talk about it because, you know, it's like, who wants to sort of cross the company strategy, right? So yeah. I didn't listen to your team, look at your metrics, and that's the way life is. I mean, things don't work, pivot. It's okay, you know? But now you can't be pivoting every week. That 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 would be disaster. That that means there's something else wrong in the organization. But uh, but it's totally fine to pivot as long as you have done a thorough job and given it enough time to look at the metrics and look at the team sentiment. And I think you can go from there. Awesome, love that. Yeah, thank you, Manik. Uh, now the next question is from uh, Ramanan Murthy, who is a product owner at Xerox, and he asked. How would you describe the evolution of product management over the last 10 years, reflecting on your experience at Google and Uber? And I'll add further to that. Where do you see it going? Um, so I think <clears throat> there are a couple of trends I would say uh, I've observed over the last 10 years. One is um, PMs are generally, the, the PM role and the function is probably evolving more as a GM at this point. And, and this is not new, like Amazon has been doing this for years, right? Where they've had these two pizza team led by a GM. The GM can be a PM, can be an engineer, can be an ops person, doesn't matter, but they have always have this one neck to choke, right? And everyone is kind of working towards that. I think the PM, the product management function is also evolving in that manner, because more and more companies are becoming product companies, right? Like there's so many companies out there, even the traditional companies, the big companies, you will look at them and say, well, yeah, they're sales driven or they're finance driven. But ultimately, because of technology innovation and, 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 and the penetration, almost all of them are now thinking of themselves as product companies. So, so you know, your job is, a, I mean, and this is what I've seen over the last 10 years, that that's been one trend where it's more GM. What does that mean? It means that, you know, you have to, um, you don't have to just think about working with engineering, right, or design. You now have to work with sales. You have to work with marketing. You have to work with PR, with legal, you know, and kind of have a holistic view. And in many cases, P P uh, PMs do that, but in many companies, PMs don't do that at all, right? But but that's kind of one one trend that I've seen. Um, in terms of the future, what are some of the trends? Um, I would say, like for instance, we were talking about one of them just now. Acquiring customers is getting harder, right? Because uh, you have like these gatekeepers. So how can you come up with better innovative skills in terms of customer acquisition and retention? So that's one one area. Second is look at all of us, right? We are remote. Right? How do you work in a remote environment? Now, is that here to stay? We don't know, um, you know, but some of it is here to stay in my opinion, right? So, so how do you build remote teams? How do you work with remote teams? How do you make sure that you're able to be productive yourself? Your team is able to be productive as a PM. It's your responsibility to kind of drive that. Um, experimentation is another big trend. It's becoming central to how, um, how products get built and uh, how do you set up the right experimentation framework? Do you trust the data? Huge question, right? You can have any framework you want, but if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. So you have to have the data pipelines which power the experiment so that when the results come out and you take a look at them, you can make a decision as opposed to the decision being, eh, we don't know what happened. Like that's not a good outcome, right? So, so you have to sort of, 
you know, build towards that and build those skills. Um, and a couple of other things I'd say are, are like, I think there is a there is a another thing that I picked up at Uber which was very interesting. You know, customer service teams typically have been so far removed from product, and I think that's changing very fast, and it should change because customer service at this point is becoming quantified. Right, uh, a lot of customer service aspects are moving to self-service support. Uh, people are able to get metrics in terms of call volumes and stuff like that. And having a very strong connection between your customer service organization and the product organization, and having that back and forth closed loop. We shipped a product. What really happened? And oh, by the way, here are some leading indicators of where our customers are churning. We did a bunch of work around that at Uber, and that was very well received. So. So building those sort of skill sets around how to think about customer service as a core stakeholder in your product development process is uh, is is another trend that I think it's worth watching. Awesome. So that would be around like I, I've heard good things about Uber's product operations teams. They're very strong at in getting all the feedback and internalizing it. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. So um, a last set of questions around on what you're up to right now. So what inspired you've you've left Uber and you've started CV Key Project. So what inspired you to start CV Key Project? And what are some trends that you see in privacy that are north noteworthy? Yeah, so so we started, I started, a, I co-founded a nonprofit in April this year. Uh, it's called cvkeyproject.org. Um, and the, the genesis of that is we were very focused on how can society, society meaning businesses and, and, and schools and universities and everybody else, how can society reopen responsibly from COVID-19, right? Because as we all, at least in the United States, as we have seen, there's been a big spike of cases and then it started going down, society reopened and then the cases started going up again and then they closed down again. And we kind of predicted that this is what's going to happen. So we, we built a set of applications, a set of apps that, are that, that have three things. It allows communities to, check symptoms like it allows an individual to check their symptoms against COVID-19 um, they get detailed communication with regards to what are the policies in place in their community and then they also get an ability to enter buildings as long as they are certified safe by the community policies right so so we build this uh, app out it's available in the app store if you search for CV key you can download it on iOS or Android and we have deployed this now in the University of Kansas as our first first sort of pilot and we have more than uh, you know a few thousand people already using it on a daily basis who are doing all these symptom checking getting the right information from the university and when they go to every university building they're able to show their credentials and we did all of that in a privacy preserving way right so our goal was to kind of move the conversation forward uh, and a bunch of us it's about 30 people we are all volunteers uh, it's a non-profit and uh, all, most of us are from Google or Uber. So we have done a lot of these physical world, digital world sort of combinations. And our goal was to kind of move the conversation forward and build this really important, uh, you know, health status, health verification kind of a uh, system. So that's what we have built. And um, in terms of privacy, I think a couple of things I'd mentioned. One is um, people are demanding that they, they that their data uh, is, uh, is uh, managed in the appropriate way more and more. Uh, if you look at what happened with Europe and GDPR, uh, which is the regime that was uh, the data regime that was launched a couple of years ago, uh, it became really important uh, for uh, for companies to treat user data in a in a proper manner, right? So I would see one of the trends is going to be users will have more and more control, and they'll demand more control over their data, and they'll like to understand how their data is being used. Um, and the second is there is a concept of differential privacy that's picking up a lot of steam right now, uh, which is about how do you create a privacy architecture where, where you don't have to share your personal data, but through some sort of cohort analysis, you can have enough information so that you can still provide the service, but not sacrifice an individual's privacy. So that's like a new set of techniques that are coming out. Our job was at CV Key was to make sure that we use the best that's out there. We haven't deployed differential privacy to that level. We have taken an approach where your data never leaves your phone. So there's nothing in the cloud, right? So, so there are all these new techniques that will come up and I think people will adopt products because they value their privacy uh, in a much more important manner. 
That's awesome. And I would highly encourage everyone to go check out CV Key Project, support the project. You'll see the team is absolutely stellar, including Monik. And it's a really, really interesting, interesting project. So, so guys, that brings us to 45 minutes, and that's time. Uh, you know, I would like to do a round of applause of clapping for Monik for coming here. So you can do that virtually. So if everyone can please hit the emoji, let's give Monik a clap. And, and Monik, thank you so much for spending time in here talking to us about the importance of innovation. Because, you know, if you don't innovate, you're going to be replaced. It's super important for all of us to do that. And it's impressive to see a company that's worth over $70 billion innovate on, on scale as a process. So thank you, Monik. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another for another event as part of Product Mastery Series. We hope to see you at the next one.